Oh. So, it's me again. Hi, everyone. Who isn't a fan of Succession? And the plus and the blustering, withholding, cantankerous patriarch of the Waystar Royco dynasty, Logan Roy. Brian Cox practically reaches and grabs you through the screen with his withering stare, explosive temper, and voracious ambition. Don't believe me? Let's take a look. This is not the end. Oh, boy. I'm going to build something better, something faster, lighter. Mina Wilder, and I'm gonna do it from in here, with you lot, you fucking pirates! Give him... <laughs> but this is not Brian... Rodeo. He began his career as a classically trained Shakespearean actor and has spent the last six decades working on both the stage and screen, inhabiting countless iconic characters, and not surprisingly, racking up two BAFTAs, two Olivier Awards, an Emmy, a Golden Globe, and a Screen Actors Guild Award, with many more, I'm sure, still to come. Please welcome Brian Cox. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be talking to you. But first, I have to ask you, Brian, do people really come up to you on the street and ask you to tell them to fuck off? All the, <laughs> all the fucking time. <laughs> and I mean, my, the, 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 the most bizarre incident of that was when I was in, it was the Golden Globes time, and I was in, uh, I was in LA, and uh, Rosanna Arquette was an old friend of mine, and she said, I'm having, there's a Me Too meeting going on this weekend uh, with Ronan Farrow. He's coming, and he's going to read some stuff from his book, and would you, would you come along and watch? And it was full of these Hollywood-type women, and uh, I said, oh, sure, I'd, yeah, I'd love to come on. But I arrived late, so I'm standing at the back watching him doing his stuff, and it was very impressive very impressive indeed and he finished and they gave him a round of applause and they turned around and they saw me and they immediately went oh you know get their devices out and they, they went up to me and they said could you tell us to fuck off <laughs> and i said is that really appropriate at a me too meeting <laughs> that you ask a white dinosaur like me, because that's what they call me now, I'm a white dinosaur, that to f tell you to fuck off? Well, fuck off then. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, uh, I want to just mention that Brian's wife, Nicole, is here, who's also an actress. Nicole, where are you? I just want to recognize you. Hi, Nicole. Where is <laughs> Welcome she? Welcome to Aspen. Where is she? <laughs> Um, so let's talk about Succession, Brian. What, what did you think when you first got that script? Well, you don't get a script. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a common illusion. Uh, you get a script when you start to do it, but, uh, but you get the pitch or the idea. And that was what was there for me. And I knew straight away it was going to be, it was going to be a success because it's very much in, I mean, even though it's a whole different ball game because of the satire, satiric nature of it, but it's very much in the Dallas dynasty. It's in that kind of league of the- I like how you say dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's supposed to dynasty. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish, I wish Americans could learn how to fucking pronounce properly. <laughs> It really does fucking annoy me how, how you know, they, they have, uh, I get so confused. Anyway, uh, so, I, I, so I knew that, that it was going, and then because of the subject, and Jesse had written a film about the Murdochs before, and I knew it was just going to be a success. Adam McKay, and the irony was, and this is another irony, so I'm listening to this, and I, I said to Jesse, I said, you know, he, he could be Scots, uh, Logan Roy. And Jesse said, oh, no, 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 he can't be Scots. He's got to be American. He's got to be American. Adam McKay, on the other hand, and there's another thing that the Americans have done to the Scottish language. Uh, the real, we don't say McKay in Scotland. We say Mackay. That's the, how you properly pronounce that name, Mackay. Anyway, Adam McKay Mackay, he thought, because he's a 
ex-Scot, well, his family were 100 years ago, he said, I think that's a great idea. There's, no, no, it's got to be American. So we left it at that. And then in the ninth episode, the ninth episode of the first series, well, actually, in the first episode, I, they said he's got, to become, he's got to be from the States. So I'm starting working on it. I'm doing it. And again, you get the script incrementally. You don't always get the whole thing. Well, we do do a reading, but then they rewrite it. So I get it. I get the script, and it says, born in Quebec. <laughs> and I thought, I didn't know Quebec was in the States. <laughs> I always thought that was Canada. And anyway, that was... Anyway, so I was born in Quebec, so, but I'd already started doing whatever accent I was doing. The ninth episode, Peter Friedman, who plays uh, Frank, who I keep firing and rehiring, he said, um, they've changed your birthplace. I said, what do you mean they've changed my birthplace? He said, you're no longer born in Quebec. I said, so where am I born? He said, oh, I can't remember. And then he took his device out and he went and he said, oh, yeah. He said, somewhere called Dundee, Scotland. <laughs> And I said, but that's where I was born. And he said, well, that's a coincidence. <laughs> I said, yeah, it's a hell of a fucking coincidence. I said, this is the ninth episode, and now you're telling me I'm Scots? And I thought I was American Quebecian <laughs> or Quebecois American. I said, this is ridiculous. So I go up to Jesse and I said, so, so what is with the change of nationality? And this is, this is typical of writers. He said, oh, we all thought it'd be a little surprise. <laughs> I said, it's a hell of a fucking surprise. <laughs> I said, I've been working on the show for nine episodes, and suddenly I'm this, you know, Scott, anyway. I'm so it. glad I asked uh, everyone at the Aspen Institute if I could drop an F-bomb during yeah. this interview. Because, Sorry, you, no, it's you've fine. started me off now. You <laughs> it's see? fine, it's fine. My language is normally quite good until I get into situations like this. <laughs> well, let's talk about, you know, you mentioned it's like Dynasty or Dynasty and um, some other sort of dramatic shows. But to, let's, let's talk about it a little bit more, Brian. What is it about succession that just grabbed people and made them you know, so excited week after week to well, see I, what was going to happen. I, I think we, we live in this age of the ultra-rich, and we see it all the time with the horrible Trump and uh, uh, Musk, Elon Musk and Bezos. We see the, the rich are getting richer, and the gap, I did, as a follow-up, I did a program which has not been released here yet called How the Other Half Lives. I know, I actually watched the trailer, oh, it looks did. amazing. So yeah. I, that was a heartfelt thing, because I had to go home to my hometown and see how poor people had become and how worse it was even than when I was a kid. I mean, the, you know, depersonalization. In the, the block of flats that I lived in, you know, everybody had their name on the door, but now they've taken that away, and they all have numbers. So this whole depersonalization goes on, and the, the poor are getting poorer, and the rich are getting richer. And then the other thing that goes with the rich is this sense of entitlement. And that's what you're dealing with in the show. And it's, it's satirical, but it's also about the state of the world as it is at the moment. And that's why I think it's a very original and very unique show in that way. When I was watching it, sometimes I would think, I mean, I, I, I loved it. And I thought the writing, the, obviously the acting. But I would s kind of say to myself, I don't like any of these people. No. No, this is the interesting thing. Everybody didn't like the people, but then they couldn't do without them. You know, you know they wanted to watch it more and more and more. And, and that's the strength of the show. It's also, I mean, it's also essentially comic in its undercurrent, you know. So there's a lot of that element, and you see it with people like uh, Kieran, you know, and uh, Nick Braun, and even Matthew McFadden, and, and occasionally me, you know. So. Uh, <laughs> That element is quite strong, that satirical humor that goes through it. And it's also something that's very part, because predominantly we have, we have two or three American writers, but it's predominantly British writers. All of them are mainly British. And so they have that kind of sharp political sensibility, you know, to get at the subject. I called our mutual friend, Frank Rich, who's an executive producer 
on Succession to see if I could get some inside scoop on you. He said, uh, he told me you'd be the easiest interview of my career. So he also wanted me to ask you about your, your loving, almost parental relationships with some of the actors <laughs> on the show, like, like Kieran Culkin and Sarah Snook. So talk to me about, and all of us, about working with some of these enormously talented young actors. Well, you know, the, Sarah was already an accomplished actress. I mean, she had a very fine career in Australia in the theater, and she's just astonishing. Her diction sometimes I worry about, but she's quite good. <laughs> she's oh, Australian. Uh, no, no, it's not just the Australian, it's the ends of... Uh, we'll t I'm going to talk about that tonight when I'm doing the Shakespeare thing. <laughs> it, it, you know, I, 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 clarity is important, you know, and in a show like this, you sometimes can toss the words away a little too much. Anyway, that's a different note. <laughs> Uh, but Sarah is formidable. She's absolutely formidable in the role. She's, I mean, in the last series, uh, the last two episodes, the last episode that my wife insisted I watch, uh, I never watch it. It's, I always view it's bad enough doing it without having to watch it. <laughs> but I, my wife does make me watch it. And uh, it was so good, and she was so extraordinary in that last episode, as was Matthew, both of them. But the real hero for me, is Kieran Culkin. Thank you. Because Kieran, you know, he would not worked for quite a while. He came along, and they originally were thinking him for Nick, and, uh, for Nick's part, Greg. And uh, he wasn't interested in Greg. He really wanted to play Roman. And uh, he got the role, finally got the role. And when he came, when he started, he was very nervous. This was a big job for him. And to see his growth over the six years that we'd been working is phenomenal. When we, you know, we always get, everybody used to get these, what they call alt lines, because essentially our writers are comic writers. They always have the alt lines, so there's always an alt gag. Now, when it was first suggested to Kieran, he had two alt lines, and he freaked out. He didn't know what to do. He thought, what am I going to do? I said, you'll be fine. Just do it. It's okay. You'll be fine. By the end of the show, he was doing five pages of alt lines. <laughs> I, you kind of got that sense yeah, because and, he's so... Yeah, and he just became more and more wonderful. And to see him grow and gain in confidence and to see what a job does to an actor in that way where suddenly they blossom in the most extraordinary way. And that was what was so wonderful about working with Kieran and seeing him come to that, as, you know, as with the others. As well. You know, meanwhile, though, it's pretty obviously obvious that Jeremy Strong, Brian, got on your last nerve. He plays Kendall Roy, and he's a method actor. I've oh, been yes. reading a lot about this and insisted yeah. on staying in character. When you say he should celebrate his gift and go back to his trailer and have a hit of marijuana. <laughs> That's the best so, way to do it. <laughs> why are you not a fan of method acting, and how does that differ from your approach to a well, role? Well, I'll tell you what happened. It's a, I'll try and make it as short as I can. Uh, the group theater in the 1930s in New York, which was Ilya Kazan, uh, John Garfield, um, Lee Strasberg, Cheryl Crawford, Bobby, uh, Bobby Davis, uh, Bobby Lewis, sorry, and they started this group theater, and they all were great believers in the work of Stanislavski. And there was this one element in Stanislavski's work, which was called, the Americans, you guys call it emotional memory, Stanislavski called it affective memory. And it's a, it, it's a kind of condition that you go through where you, you revisit trauma of childhood, and it's supposed to open you up emotionally. But it's without thought, and that's what the difficulty is. So the great Stella Adler was very questioning about what was going on. So she decided to take herself to Paris, where she knew that uh, Stanislavski spent the summers, because he was allowed to do that. And she went to see him, and she said, Maestro, we, we've started this group theater, and we're all great believers in your work, and we want to know we're just questioning the notion of effective and emotional memory. And Stanislavski, oh, I got rid of that years ago. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. He said, no, it, it's fine. 
you know, in minuscule form if there's a necessary thing that needs to be dealt with. He said, but it does interfere with the imagination. It stops the imagination flowing. And I, that's why I, I, I stopped it. So she goes back to New York, and there's this big meeting. They're all in the theater. And she comes to the question, so what did the maestro say? And he said, well, effect of emotional memory, he, he doesn't believe in it anymore. And there was a silence. And Strasbourg said, then Stanislavski is wrong. <laughs> Hence the method acting. <laughs> And, I mean, it worked for a certain extent. I mean, it was great in the 50s. But you see, Brando, contrary to what everybody felt, Brando was never a method actor. James Dean was, but Brando never was Paul Newman was, because Brando actually studied with Stella Adler. He didn't study with Strasbourg at all. I mean, he went to a couple of his classes and fooled around. He was a bit naughty that way. <laughs> but it, it, it's, so it's interesting. And what I, what I believe the actors are is that I think we are instruments, we are, we are transmitters. We transmit energy. Energy comes through us and, you know, I've worked with a lot of children and I think children are the best actors. They don't do research, they don't prepare their roles, they don't go into an emotion, they just do it. And they do it because of the power of their imagination. There's a video which I would recommend to you. Oh, it's on YouTube. Is oh, this the YouTube? one you teaching yeah. the child Hamlet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Have you seen it? I haven't, but I read about yeah. it, and I'm going to. There's, there's, I, I teach this two-and-a-half-year-old boy to be or not to be, the speech, Hamlet speech. And he's extraordinary. He gets distracted, but he comes back. And it's wonderful to watch this kid who's just has a natural imagination that he allows to flow into the, into the words. Now, that's what's important, is always never interfere with the imagination. Keep it free, keep it light. Of course, you go into dark areas, and that's part of the job. But sometimes, if you, if you over-involve it, you kind of, it, it's, it, it's, it disrupts the harmony of the group. You Did know. you ever say to Jeremy Strong, knock it off? No. <laughs> Did you want to? Uh, what? Did you want to? Constantly. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't do that. Yeah. I, I wouldn't do that. I mean, he knows how I stand, and we've, you know, so that it's all come out. And we're very sweet. We're very, I mean, I love acting with Jeremy. Don't get me wrong. Jeremy's a wonderful actor. I just don't think he needs all that nonsense. You know, I think he can do it without all of that. And he has, I mean, it's, my, my example of that is Dan Day-Lewis, who is a brilliant actor, absolutely brilliant actor. I was watching the program that's on Steven Spielberg and it was showing him, revisiting him as, as Abraham Lincoln. I thought it was an amazing performance. But Dan retires at the age of 55. From my point of view, as a 77-year-old, 55 is when the parts started to get better. That's when you really started to enjoy the work, because suddenly at the age of 55, you think, well, I know a bit now. I can actually do it a wee bit, you know. But Dan's going, no, it's too much. It's all too painful. And you go, oh, bollocks. Just <laughs> do it. Lit, and, and, and you've got incredible, exciting projects, which, which we'll talk about in a moment. But I want to talk a little bit more about Logan Roy, if I may. Mm -hmm. you, you, you talk about this character, how it's, it's never fully explored, Logan, yeah. what makes him tick. And you said in one interview that it comes from a bitter experience. It's a mystery because Jesse Armstrong hasn't revealed it. I mean, you saw me swimming in season one, episode seven, and you see the marks on my back, mm -hmm. but it's never explained. When you were playing Logan Roy, did you think about childhood hurts or trauma or what was motivating this very complicated man? Well, you, you, it all lies with his sister Rose. He has a sister Rose. It's very interesting that, I don't know if Jesse realizes this, but uh, the girl in the glass menagerie, Tennessee Williams' sister, is called Rose, yeah. ironically enough. So she had polio, she got polio, and he may have given it to her. That's what he feels. So that's his bitter thing, that's his thing that he's most, angry with this himself for, and he blames himself for the death of his sister. And Jamie Cromwell 
in the funeral scene does this brilliant oration. I thought it was really moving. And, and then Kieran's reaction was just equally moving about telling the story, the background of, of, of the family. And I just felt that Logan is constantly misunderstood. He's regarded as being this bully or Hector. Well, he does all of that. But he has, all he wants to do is find a successor from his own children to take over his job, to take over the business. And they, they don't, I mean, my favorite line in the whole show is, you know, I love you, but you are not serious people. And that is the clue to everything. It's that, really about entitlement. Exactly, it's about entitlement. That they, they're playing the entitlement game all the time. That, oh, they have naturally, they're, they're there at the front line, so therefore they should be able to take over and should be able. But they haven't got the balls to do it, none of them. And also, they vacillate so much. I mean, he thinks that uh, he has a strong feeling about, about uh, Shiv. He, he really does think that Shiv could do it. And he, he, he hopes that. But then Shiv, she just dissipates everything. She talks too much. She's going to one way, then the other. She's, she loses the, the singularity of purpose, which she so clearly has in the beginning episodes, and it becomes very dissipated. So Logan is always in a state of having to deal with these children and deal with them in a way, you know, yes, he's hectoring, yes, he's bullying, and yes, he's a particularly, particularly tough father. But, and he doesn't know how to express himself because he's never known how to express himself. So that's his loss. That's his tragedy, if you like. But I, I've always felt, I mean, there's, there's an example. In, um, in the last episode the, 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 of the end of the third season when Jeremy and I have that big sit-down dinner together, and Jeremy, bring, the guy brings on plates and he hands the plate and he said, oh, that's not for him. That's, and I know that Jeremy's, that, that Kendall has done that to make me think, oh, that's poisoned, you know, and I go along with it. Because I know it's not poisoned, but I think it's a bloody silly thing to just do that thing of thinking, I'm trying to make me think this is a poisoned plate. And so I bring in my grandson, and I get him to test the thing. And everybody thinks, oh, it's horrible what he's doing to his grandson. He's no intention of poisoning his grandson because the bloody thing isn't poison. He knows that. But of course, everybody thinks, oh, that's so cruel. But they don't understand what the real motive is. The real motive is to say, listen, Kendall, you are making such a stupid mistake. And doing these little gestures where you're trying to make me think one thing will not work. It will not work. It will not cut any, you know, any mustard with me. And I... That's what's so great about the role, is the role is open to such, such delicacy of interpretation. I want to spend a few minutes just talking about your childhood, Brian, because you grew up, as you mentioned, in working class Dundee. Your father was a shopkeeper. Your mom worked at a, at a jute mill. She did originally, yeah. And uh, I know your dad died when you were just eight years old and left you and your mom pretty destitute. Yeah. Um, you've said that your early, that your early life, uh, you said that your early life in poverty affects you even today. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like Talk the about Damocles, that. It's the Damocles sword that hangs over my head. I mean, it, it just is. You know, when you live at the level of poverty that we lived at after my father passed, it was a very, it was pretty awful. But the irony was, I didn't feel it at the time. I just got on with it, as you do. You just adjust. You know, you lose somebody, you adjust. And, you know, it's, 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 it's just, you know, we so underestimate our own powers. We're constantly looking at belief systems to help us out, but we forget about who we are, how important memory is to us, and how we are sustained by memory. And we underestimate memory because we all have it. That's what we all share. We all share the memories of the, our loved ones, of those who've passed. And we carry those. I mean, my sister, my 90-year-old, 92-year-old sister who looked after me a, a lot from a distance when I was, you know, at, at that time, she passed just recently, and she's still with me. I mean, she'll always be with me. My dad is still with me. My mom is still with me. These people are still with us. And we don't, we, we, we forget that's an extraordinary power that we have, 
that power to hold on to those people from the past. You lived across from a fish and chip fish shop, and, chip shop yeah. and you would go over there as a little boy asking, well, you tell the story. Well, it, it only happened on a, didn't happen all the time, but <clears throat> I mean, my mother used to get, my mother was in a, she was in a hospital for nervous diseases. She had a series of nervous breakdowns and then she had electric shock treatment, which, I mean, she lost something like, I think she lost about, I don't know, what, well, it's, I can only say in English, five stone, which is a lot of five fours of 20, five, one, eight, 70 pounds, she lost 70 pounds. And she was very thin. And she only got a, 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 a pension on a, a Friday morning. So on Thursday, we, would, we probably didn't have any money at all. So it, it wasn't all the time, it was once or twice. So I would go across to the fish and chip shop and I would ask for batter bits from the back of the chip pan. And that would be our dinner. So they'd pack up the batter bits and give it to us. And that's what we ate. I know that, that, that um, the theater, acting, movies, kind of, they saved you in a way. Oh, yeah. I read that there were 21, how could this be, 21 movies? There were 21 theaters? cinemas. There were 21 cinemas in my hometown in the, in, in the 50s. Now there are three. And it was amazing. You would go constantly. I'd go to all of them, all of them. From the age, I went to the cinema, this is the other thing, I went to the cinema on my own from the age of six. You know, I would go off, disappear. And my mother said, where have you been? I said, been in the movies, in the pictures. We called it the pictures back home. And, and you fell in love with one actor in particular. Mm -hmm. Tracy, yeah. Spencer Tracy to me is probably the greatest screen actor ever because of his delicacy, his commitment and his comedy. I mean, you know, you know, the, you know TCM is under great threat at the moment. Uh, Warner Brothers wants to stop it. And I think it's a shame, it's tragic, because Turner Classic Movies provides an enormous service about the history of cinema. And to see, there's just been a Catherine Hepburn season, to see Hepburn and Tracy in the movies they did together, and to see the delicacy and the beauty of the work they did is, for me, it's a joy. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's my encyclopedia, you know. You, you not only went to see movies several times a week, but you joined the Dundee Repertory Theater when you were just 14. Yeah, well, You're, I was just, I was, I, I, I got the job when I was 14, but I started when I was 50. But you were basically, you went there to run errands, right? Yeah, I just used to take the money to the bank, and I did, I did a lot of idiotic things as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then you left for London at 17. Yeah, I went to, yeah. And you well, went, as soon as I walked into the theater, because I had, my family had become so broken up, I felt at home. I felt this was my home. And I felt that all my life. I mean, the theater has really sustained me and I'm, I'm so grateful to it. And was there a moment when you realized this, this is my gift, this is what I wanna do, this is where I'm going to put all my energy? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that it's, it's the same commitment that a priest has that anybody who wants a kind of, some kind of spiritual experience has, because there's, there's a lot of spiritual stuff comes out of the theater, actually. Was there a role, though? Was there a moment? Do you remember, or do you remember just feeling? No, I just gradually it came bit by bit, you know, and it's so weird now that it, I play this iconic figure at the age of, I'm now 77, and it's just so bizarre because I've done so much over the years. I mean, I've made something like 200, over about 209 films altogether, which is probably more than most people because I just kept working. I mean, my thing was just to keep working. And then Jesse comes up with this role and my life literally changes overnight. I mean, do you like it? Does it make you uncomfortable? How do you I feel mean, about this new, it, I mean, it, newfound fame, if you will? Well, it, it's, it's lovely on one level, but I, I didn't realize how much I prized my anonymity. You know, the fact that people didn't know who I was. And I actually quite liked that. I mean, people would say, oh, you were, oh no. Oh, yes, you were, weren't you? Oh no, you weren't. <laughs> you know, that was usually what it was for me. But, uh, you know, now uh, it's, uh, I can't go anywhere. You know, I mean, it's just really difficult. I mean, I did a fashion show in, uh, with Nicole, we did this fashion show in, uh, in Paris just recently, and now- You were I'm, attending, you weren't on the runway. I wasn't on the runway, but they put me in clothes. He's become quite the fashionista. Well, I'm, I'm now, according to GQ, the fashion icon of the moment. <laughs>
I mean, and I, I like your Ralph Lauren outfit. Uh, exactly, but I could barely tie my shoelaces. I really <laughs> find it extraordinary, really. Well, I think it's so exciting to see this success, even though you've had the talent all along. And you, I mentioned all these exciting projects you have on the horizon. Next year, you'll be playing James Tyrone in Long Day's Journey and Tonight on the West End. You're also set to play Johann Sebastian Bach. Yeah, I'm doing in, that in yeah, I'm doing that in September. In, in September, yeah, in, and it's called it, Score. Is that a is that it's a play? A score. It's a play written by uh, Oliver Cotton, and it's about Bach. It's very much in the line of what's going on now, warmongering with Putin and. Frederick the Great was a great warmonger, and Bach, they tried, Frederick the Great wanted him to join his coterie of composers because he collected them, and he was a closet composer himself, and Bach resisted, and it's a really interesting play about how he dealt with it. Uh, and uh, we're going to do that in Bath. Uh, you also have your directorial debut. I, I have my, which was supposed to happen now, but I've delayed that till next year, so I'm doing That's a film called Glenn Rothen. Glenn Rothen. It's and a film about two brothers running, well, one brother runs the distillery and the other brother was the talent, but he left 35 years before and he's He's been brought back into the fold for different reasons. So it's, it's a great script. So you're 77, but yeah. as you've mentioned twice, and you, I mean, the world, your oyster, isn't it amazing? It's pretty incredible. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I would never, I'm, ju I'm just sorry that some of my relations aren't around anymore to, <laughs> to witness, you know, that it's, it's all worked out rather well in the end. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, of course, I've enjoyed um, you extolling the virtues of the sesame seeds on the bun of a quarter pounder <laughs> recently <laughs> as the voice of McDonald's. Yeah. How in the fuck did that happen? <laughs> Well, you know, I used, to, I used to do a lot of voice. I mean, when I came to America in 1996, to, came to live here, because I decided I'd done everything that I could do, and, uh, you know, I had a great career, but I still wanted to do movies. So that was my childhood ambition. And, you know, we, don't, we do television in the UK, but we don't really do movies. And I thought, well, I'll go. And, but I had to give up my voiceover career, which was pretty good in the UK. And, and I couldn't get arrested for voiceovers here for 20 years. Suddenly, Logan Roy and, and McDonald's go hand in hand, you know, <laughs> which is a bizarre situation. So, you know, and I love it. And the copywriters, he said, when you get into it and you see these young writers writing these very tight things and being really rather brilliant, you know, you forget what, you know, and they all want to be proper writers, you know, but that's how they are in their living. So it's, it's a great job. I loved it. Will you do the thing at the end? Oh, ba da ba 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 yeah. <laughs> do it a little, do it better. I can't. <laughs> I, have to, I can't do it. I, I've, always, I've always got to listen to it before I do it. <laughs> well, I think you sound great in it, and it makes me want a quarter pounder. Well, Frank Rich was right. Not only are you the easiest interview of my career, but one of the most fun. So, oh, Brian Cox. And by the way, I bought you a present. <laughs> Okay, uh, this is all I have to say to you now. <laughs> <laughs> I cleaned it up. <laughs>